Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight... Ready on day one. While President-elect Biden assembles his team, Congress is working on the next stimulus package. As Biden says, more will be coming. Help is really right around the corner. A coronavirus vaccine may soon be on its way. The FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee prepares to meet on Thursday. What one member will be looking for from Pfizer's presentations. Even the cable companies are, are saying, we're going to give you some of your money back. Could health insurers be next? A new bill targets Medicaid money. Chicago Tonight has the exclusive story. Their state has suffered under corrupt leadership for far too long. A look at giving voters more power by allowing them to recall elected officials. I miss going to gym class and miss the teachers. How neighbors in different communities are stepping up to help students with remote learning for parents who can't work from home. Learn about our winter biking guide that'll keep you cycling safely and comfortably year round. And local plant shops put the green in greenery as their businesses blossom during the pandemic. But first, some of today's top stories. Another large gathering was shut down in Wicker Park this past weekend for violating COVID related rules. The 142 person event was billed as the Wicker Loft and investigators found no social distancing or face coverings. City officials hit the hosts of the party with multiple citations for egregiously violating COVID-19 regulations, as well as cease and desist orders for operating an illegal unlicensed club. Officials also hit Lakeview Alderman Tom Tunney with two citations for allowing diners to eat inside his restaurant and Sather, which defied a ban from the governor on indoor dining. He could face fines up to $15,000. The city says it has cited 344 businesses for violating COVID-19 regulations since March. Illinois health officials confirm more than 7,900 new cases of the coronavirus today, plus 145 deaths. That brings the state to a total of more than 804,000 cases and 13,487 deaths. The state's test positivity rate is 11.8%. And travelers and employees at O'Hare and Midway airports may soon have access to COVID-19 tests. The Chicago Department of Aviation plans to start testing next week. They'll provide both the PCR test and the rapid test. And similar to a clinic, you can provide insurance or pay cash. Tests will be administered only to those who can show proof of airport employment, have a ticket to fly within 72 hours, or flew into Chicago no more than five days earlier. And now to Paris with local members of Congress. Paris. Brandis, in the waning weeks of the lame duck session, Congress is working on the next COVID stimulus bill as well as trying to avoid another government shutdown. Here to talk about that as well as vaccine distribution and the Biden transition are Congresswoman Robin Kelly, a Democrat representing Illinois' second district, which includes parts of Chicago's far southeast side and southern suburbs. Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, a Democrat representing Illinois' eighth district, and that includes Elgin, Schaumburg and Addison. Congressman Brad Schneider, a Democrat representing Illinois' 10th district, which covers a portion of Chicago's northern suburbs in Cook and Lake counties. And Schneider is a member of the bipartisan working group caucus on that stimulus bill. And Congressman Jesus Chuy Garcia, a Democrat who represents Illinois' 4th district, and that includes parts of the northwest and southwest sides of Chicago. We invited every Republican member of the Illinois congressional delegation. None have accepted our invitation. But we do thank you all for joining us. Uh, first, uh, Congresswoman Kelly, Illinois could get its first shipment of the Pfizer vaccine next week. Uh, how many uh, vaccines will the state get and how long will this rollout last? You know, I'm not sure how many, uh, I can't remember the number, how many the state will get, but um, I know that we're one of the hubs to receive uh, the vaccine. Uh, I was speaking with Mayor Lightfoot about it today, actually, as well as New York and uh, two other places. And uh, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Krishnamurthy, you know, there's a report that the president turned down Pfizer's early offer to sell more than that initial 100 million uh, batch of vaccines. Is that going to hurt distribution at all? Well, um, it's, it's, it's an unwelcome fact that we could have bought more vaccines uh, to inoculate 330 million people. Instead, we bought about 100 million at the time. 
Um, and I've called for more transparency on the deal making surrounding the, co the COVID pandemic uh, procurement by the Trump administration. But now we're here and the incoming Biden administration must invoke a tool that the Trump administration repeatedly refused to do, which is the Defense Production Act. That particular tool allows the president to command the production of certain critical resources that are necessary for fighting in a crisis uh, such as the one we're in right now. And, um, and so uh, using that uh, authority, hopefully we can scale up to the number of doses we need because we got to inoculate the entire population to get past this crisis. And that could take several months. Let's listen to what uh, President-elect Biden said recently on the subject. There is no detailed plan that we've seen anyway as to how you get the vaccine out of a container into an injection syringe into somebody's arm. And it's going to be very difficult for that to be done in this very expensive proposition. Congressman, no detail. What does that mean for the prospects of a majority of the country getting vaccinated? Uh, very simply is we, we need a supply chain um, control system. This is something that I've been calling on for the administration going back to February. Uh, we've seen the consequences of this throughout the summer. And that's why it's so important that uh, we put in place, uh, as, as President-elect Biden said, a, a process to get the vaccine from the manufacturer to the distribution center. Uh, my understanding is there's actually going to be 109,000 doses coming to Illinois in that first round, uh, 23,000 to Chicago directly, 83,000 to a distribution center in, in Peoria. Uh, but it's got to go from the distribution center to the local communities to the actual healthcare workers who can put those those injections into people's arms. And we're looking and at video. I, I'm sorry, Congressman, so we're looking at video yeah. from an injection here. First of uh, vaccinations in the UK. Uh, Congressman Garcia, I want to move toward uh, the $100 million compromise proposal that's been out there. Uh, direct payments to Americans are not in that bill. Will that not make the final cut? Uh, hard to say. We have not uh, seen the details of what is in the $908 uh, million, a billion dollar a package that is being uh, used as a starting point in the uh, conversations. But, uh, you know, it's very clear that since the start of the pandemic, people have only received $1,200 while corporations got hundreds of millions and many large companies benefited through the payroll protection program. So in Illinois, you know, we're getting ready to see potentially up to half a million people lose their unemployment benefits right after Christmas and nationally about 16 and a half million people uh, could be out, out of a job as well and without unemployment benefits. But Congressman Schneider, you've been part of this uh, bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus to come up with this compromise. Where do the negotiations stand right now? I mean, for what we heard from Senator McConnell is he wants to get rid of the uh, funding for state and local governments and then Republicans would give up the liability protections for corporations. Right. I mean, McConnell is ignoring the fact that our state and local governments are, are really struggling. They're in the, the position of of not filling positions, uh, looking at laying off people, cutting essential services at a time where they're being expected to deliver the vaccine. We've got to support our local governments, give them the resources to take care of their, their residents, our constituents, in the midst of this pandemic. The light is at the end of the tunnel. We see the vaccines coming, but it's going to be a long tunnel. We need to make sure that the states have it. So we can't give up on that. We've been working on that. It was in CARES Act. There was additional funding in the HEROES Act in, in May, HEROES II in, in September. And here we are in December, cases spiking across the country, and Mitch McConnell wanna, wants to let essentially our communities uh, go bankrupt, as he said before, our states go bankrupt, and uh, the people in those states suffer in the pandemic. Congresswoman Kelly, do you believe there will be a final agreement on at least a, a narrow stimulus bill before the Biden administration takes hold? I do. I'm an optimist and uh, I do believe that the problem solvers are on the right track and they do have uh, good things in it. You know, there is money right now for state and local government. There's money for a small business, uh, the extensions that are needed as far as the eviction moratorium. Uh, I don't think anybody, uh, no matter where you represent, I'm not speaking to Mitch McConnell, can't speak for him, want to see people out on the streets. I mean, it's the holiday season. People don't have food. I've been to so many food distributions, and I don't think uh, members of Congress or the Senate want to see people suffer 
uh, to that degree. They know that we absolutely have to do something. Congressman Krishnamurthy, even if this does get passed, most economists that we've talked to on both sides of the aisle say it won't be enough to, to keep from uh, an economic slide. So what would an additional stimulus uh, under a, a Biden administration have to look like and what could get passed in Congress, do you believe? You're correct. We have about 10 million people unemployed. And um, in Illinois alone, our restaurants, 50% uh, of restaurants are going to close in six months if they don't get additional aid. Um, I think under an incoming Biden administration, if we can get a smaller stimulus package passed now, I think what we're going to need is we're going to need, again, continued unemployment benefits. We're going to need continued payroll protection program money, PPP money for small businesses, but we need direct checks to families. This is essential. We have to remember that uh, a lot of these folks are seeing increased expenses right now at the very time that we're seeing a soft economy. For instance, a lot of people are having to take care of their children at home or uh, figure out ways to deal with childcare um, uh, expenses that they didn't anticipate because our schools are closed. So these are the types of things that we have to be very practical about right now because we need to open up the economy even at the same time we're vaccinating the population and uh, we got to get past this economic crisis. We cannot deliver a lump of coal uh, around the holidays for the American people. All right, uh, and those uh, direct checks to individuals, again, not part of the negotiation so far. We're gonna have to leave it there right now. Uh, and again, we invited every Republican member of the Illinois congressional delegation None accepted our invitation. We'll be joined again by these members of Congress a little later in the program to discuss defense, DACA, and the failure of most Republicans to recognize President-elect Biden as the election winner. But for now, our thanks to Congressman Kelly, Krishnamurthy, Schneider, and Garcia. And now to Phil Ponce and a member of the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee, Phil. Paris, as we heard earlier, the United Kingdom began distributing Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine to citizens today, and the U.S. may soon follow. The Food and Drug Administration released documents today confirming Pfizer's data, finding the vaccine to meet standards for emergency use authorization. An FDA advisory committee will meet on Thursday to discuss the data and their recommendations. And the agency's decision on whether to grant authorization is expected within days of that meeting. Joining us on what to look for during Thursday's meeting is Dr. Arshana Chatterjee. Chatterjee. She serves on the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, and she's the dean of the Chicago Medical School at Roslyn Franklin University of Medicine and Science in North Chicago. And Dr. Chatterjee, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, could you briefly describe what your committee does? I imagine it's not a committee that a lot of people have heard about. That's true, Phil. We review data submitted by the sponsors, which is the vaccine manufacturers, uh, and evaluate the efficacy and safety of uh, the trial data that, that the trial data show, uh, and then make recommendations after discussion and voting, make recommendations to the FDA on whether to approve or not approve um, the um, vaccine licensure or approval in this case. Uh, and also whether uh, there are additional studies needed, et cetera. My understanding is that members of this committee have to fill out a conflict of interest form. Why is that? Well, you want to make sure that this advisory committee, which is composed of experts in the field of vaccinology, ethics, uh, immunology, et cetera, are completely independent of the process of the development of, of these products. And so, in order to ensure that independence, the conflict of interest has to be reviewed carefully. As we mentioned today, the FDA uh, reported that their own scientists found the vaccine to be safe and effective. Why is it necessary for your committee to weigh in? I think it's very important, Phil, to note that, first of all, our committee has been in existence, not this specific committee, but the first act committee has been in existence many decades before, before COVID ever came along. And the committee is charged with reviewing, independently reviewing the data that are submitted by the, um, by the manufacturers and 
purpose of the committee is really to be independent, not only of the manufacturers, but also of the government. And particularly this year and with, with the COVID vaccines, with all of the concerns that have been raised around, you know, influence uh, from the, the government in trying to uh, move these vaccines along in, in their development, I think it's particularly important that uh, our committee uh, is seen as the independent group that it is uh, of uh, vaccinologists, immunologists, other experts, uh, as well as a, a community member who uh, sits on our committee to uh, ensure that independence. So your committee meets on Thursday. Uh, let's say that uh, you, you approve it. What happens next? Um, we don't actually approve it. We recommend approval to the FDA. The FDA has publicly stated uh, that they will accept our recommendations. Uh, we will also uh, perhaps make recommendations for um, additional studies uh, that may be needed or additional data that may be needed. Uh, the FDA takes all of that information uh, and um, reviews it all, uh, makes a decision based on uh, those recommendations that we make and then moves forward. Doctor, as you know, there are concerns that this whole process has been so expedited, uh, not just the development of the vaccine, but the approval process. Some people are concerned about that. Uh, your response? I would say we are in an extraordinary time. I don't think this is overstating it. Uh, there is a pandemic that is impacting people around the globe, um, having a devastating effect on health systems, on people's lives and livelihoods. Uh, and there are literally people getting sick and dying every minute of the day. So we are faced with a true public health crisis of global proportions. In the face of that, we have to look at what we can do to control this pandemic and public health measures that have been put in place, as you know, for many months now, have had mixed impact. In some areas, they have been fairly effective, in others, not as much. Uh, so the next step then in controlling this is to try to develop a vaccine. And it is true that uh, the development effort has moved forward at a very rapid pace, as has the approval uh, mechanism. Uh, however, it's important to note that uh, the steps in, in that process have, for the most part, been followed. There are some steps that are different with this emergency use authorization mechanism as opposed to a biologic licensure application, which is the usual way that vaccines are licensed. But that's really the, the primary difference in terms of the process. Dr. Shatterjee, thank you so much for this update and good luck, on, uh, good luck at your meeting on Thursday. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bill. And up next, the Chicago Tonight exclusive details on a proposal aimed at getting billions of tax dollars back from insurance companies. So stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. It's no secret that Illinois is having major budget difficulties due partly to the COVID-19 pandemic. Illinois pays billions of dollars into the state and federally funded Medicaid program covering more than 2 million residents. Chicago Tonight has learned exclusively that a group of lawmakers plans to demand billions of dollars back from private health care companies that run Illinois' Medicaid program. Paris is back with more on that story. Paris. Brandis, this is a proposal that could net $3 billion into state tax coffers. So what some lawmakers are saying is that it's time for private health insurance companies that have seen big profits since COVID began to make sacrifices for state taxpayers. And to put this into perspective, Brandis, Illinois gives billions of dollars, as you mentioned, to managed care organizations to run the Medicaid program. And that is the health insurance that covers, as you mentioned, about 2 million low income state residents. Now, a state senator and representative plan to file a bill tomorrow in the Illinois General Assembly that would, in effect, give the state the ability to claw back 20% of that money from these organizations during a disaster declaration 
which Illinois is under right now. Governor Pritzker did declare disaster for COVID on March 9th. And the provision in this money is to re in this bill is to redirect that money from the insurance companies to critical care and safety net hospitals like Mercy Hospital in Bronzeville that are in danger of closing because of underfunding. Now, Democratic State Representative Fred Crespo says he believes these health care companies can afford to give back. We know that hospitals have not been uh, doing uh, services that they normally do, elective surgery. Uh, doctors have not opened their offices, so costs have gone down. So the plan here is to say, hey, we should at least take back 20% of their profits and redirect back to other Medicaid expenses that the state has. So he's saying take 20% of the profits from these organizations. Now, here are the companies that run Medicaid managed care in Illinois. Most of them are private health care companies like Meridian Health. They enroll about 800,000 um, enrollees. Blue Cross Blue Shield, about 391,000. And then there's County Care, which is actually run by the Cook County Health System. And then on down the line, you see there. Now, in the second quarter of 2020 alone, the parent company, Blue Cross Blue Shield, saw $2 billion in profits. That doubled it perform its performance from last year. So Peoria State Senator Dave Kaler says health insurers should follow the lead of other companies and other industries that have offered rebates in this pandemic. Take the auto insurance industry. They're giving uh, rebates back to their customers because people just aren't driving as much. Uh, we see that uh, uh, you know, property and casualty insurers are doing the same thing. Even the cable companies are, are saying, we're going to give you some of your money back. Uh, uh, you know, your, the phone companies. I mean, there's a lot of industries that have already set uh, the pattern for this to say, hey, let's help people out during a pandemic. In Paris, can the state legally just demand this money back from the insurance companies, even if they're contracted to pay a certain amount? Well, these lawmakers believe they can if it becomes law and the governor signs this bill, although they wouldn't be surprised, they say, if these insurance companies decided to sue and say, well, we have a contract that's supposed to pay a certain amount, a disaster declaration or not. Now, meanwhile, the CEO of the Illinois Association of Medicaid Providers say they oppose this plan and say there are already provisions to give states the money, Illinois the money back should there be fewer insurance claims or should costs go up. And health care costs decrease significantly. There is already a provision in the contract where the health plans would return dollars to the states um, that they could use to uh, invest in education or other um, funding sources. But to be really clear, Paris, we're not seeing a decrease in utilization and we're not seeing a decrease in healthcare costs to the level that, um, you know, anywhere near 20%. Paris, is it unusual that Illinois basically outsources uh, all of its Medicaid to private companies like this? Well, it's an evolution that's happened, Brandis, over the last 10 years or so. It's the can of worms that some lawmakers want to open, some don't want to open. Uh, well, the state used to provide a, a more traditional Medicaid service where it's fee for service and the state runs it. Under Governor Quinn and then under Governor Rauner, it moved to this current model where it pays a lump sum to these organizations to run an HMO style plan for the Medicaid recipients. And it has been met with controversy. A 2018 state inspector general audit found that the the state was not keeping track of billions of dollars it gave to these companies. It means it didn't track how much was paid out for claims, it didn't track what claims were denied, and it didn't track administrative costs, among others. Now, Brandis, last year, according to numbers from the State Comptroller's Office, Illinois paid $16 billion to these managed care organizations, on track to do that uh, a little bit, maybe a little bit less than that this year. But if that holds up, that means under this proposal, the state could see $3 billion or more come back into state tax coffers. Okay, exclusive reporting from Paris Schutz. Thank you. For the last three months of this school year, Chicago public school parents have had to cobble together a variety of ways to be sure their kids are participating in remote learning. For many, it means juggling working from home while also being their child's teacher. But for those who cannot work from home, there are few options. We visited a couple of those options, community organizations providing families with remote learning help. Meet Manny Johnson. He's six, 16. Full of personality. Hola. And learning Spanish. Uno, dos, 
que quatorze negocies ocho nueve diez. The six-year-old is in kindergarten at Whittier Dual Language Magnet School near Pilsen. But instead of attending classes in the school, he's learning remotely, along with 341,000 other Chicago public school students. Jada Humphrey is in seventh grade at Learn 8 Middle School. Sometimes it's not going to be a lot of people at home and because they don't want me to stay at home by myself, so they just want me to come here. Um, I like coming here. Here is at Breakthrough Urban Ministries Student Achievement Program. The typical after-school program has been expanded to include daytime remote learning support for 60 students grouped into pods of 10. In this second and third grade classroom, teachers are juggling schedules from six different elementary schools and 10 different teachers. Associate Director Anna Piper says her staff has become a go-between for schools and families. Our teachers here communicate with the teachers on a daily basis, um, asking, okay, is their assignment turned in? Did you get it? Sorry, they're running late. And just kind of checking in with the teacher to make sure everything is okay on their end. Piper says in the early days of remote learning, students struggled social emotionally with the adjustment. Almost like shorter fuses, kids were getting irritated quicker and crying faster and just having like a, a shorter span to deal with difficult things or to have stamina to be able to make it through the day. Many of the students' parents are essential workers, as is the case in Auburn Gresham, where community activist Tamar Manasseh converted old shipping containers into the Mask on the Block Academy to support students and families. So you have the Instacart drivers, you have the Uber Eats delivery people, you have the people who stock the shelves at Mariano's and Walgreens. So now they're faced with either they don't go to work and they lose their jobs or they leave their kids at home alone. That's, I mean, that's a, I mean, what kind of choice is that? Manassa fears a widening of the achievement gap that already exists between black and brown students and white students in CPS. CPS leadership points to that expanding gap as it rolls out plans to reopen schools. First quarter data from the district shows attendance among black students dropped by 5% compared to the district-wide 2.9% the most of any ethnic group. Okay, let's start back over. We started at eight. And black and Latino students saw the largest increase in failing grades, from 2.3% of black elementary students last year to 6.6% this year. For Latino students, an increase from 2.1 to 5.2%. Manassa fears one crisis begetting another. COVID has created an astronomical and astounding healthcare crisis. Astounding, right? But on the other side of this, it's going to be an educational crisis unlike anything America has ever seen before. Now, despite objections from the Chicago Teachers Union, CPS is pushing ahead with plans to phase in a reopening of schools in early January. Families had until yesterday to tell the district whether they intend to return. There's no word yet from the district on when it will have a final count of how many students opted in. And we still have much more to come on Chicago Tonight. Let's see if they have the courage. What Illinois Congress members think about President Trump's relentless campaign pushing Republicans to dispute the election results. Should Illinois allow officials to be recalled from office? A look at giving voters more power by allowing them to recall elected officials. Planning to ride your bike for the first time this winter? We'll have recommendations on essential gear and bike maintenance. And talk about growth industries, sales of house plants at local shops are flourishing as people have more time to spend caring for them at home. But first, more of today's top stories. Illinois officials say the first shipment of COVID-19 vaccines will be coming next week. We are expecting vaccine uh, next week and then we expect vaccine every week after. And again, depending on which vaccines are approved, we may be looking at Pfizer initially, but hopefully uh, other vaccines will be coming on. We know that the FDA is already evaluating uh, for the Moderna vaccine. So it's hard, you know, we have numbers, but we're waiting to see approvals and waiting to see like finalized numbers, which, you know, may not be finalized till closer to the time. But we are very much looking forward to weekly allocations of vaccine to come to the people of Illinois. Officials are expecting 109,000 Pfizer vaccines to be shipped for the first week after its approval. 
In addition, more than 7,900 new cases of the coronavirus today, plus 145 deaths. This brings the state to a total of more than 804,000 cases and 13,487 deaths. Diners in Chicago will have a new fee to pay if they use DoorDash. The company is charging customers $1.50 on delivery orders in protest over a recent city council decision that limits fees to 15% of the total bill during the pandemic. The decision to limit the fees was seen as a way to help restaurants that have been struggling financially. DoorDash and other companies have typically charged restaurants 25 to 30 percent commissions on deliveries. And now back to Paris with more from members of Congress on their reaction to President Trump's campaign to dispute election results. Paris. Brandis, earlier in the program we discussed the next federal stimulus and now joining us once again are Congressman Robin Kelly, Raja Krishnamurthy, Brad Schneider and Jesus Chuy Garcia. A reminder, we invited every Republican member of the Illinois delegation, but none accepted our invitation. We are glad that you four are here with us. Uh, so let's talk about uh, some security funding, the National Defense Authorization Act, the bill that funds the military bases, pays troops overseas. The president has threatened to veto it. Uh, Congressman uh, Krishnamurthy, is there a veto-proof majority here? Should the president uh, make good on that promise? I think so. Um, and I think that his reasons for vetoing it are appalling, and I don't think anybody is going to stand for them. Um, you know, I think that our efforts to uh, remove uh, racism, unfortunately, that marks uh, even aspects of our uh, uh, our United States military and armed forces are really important right now more than ever. And I think there's a big bipartisan supermajority in favor of that. And you're referring to the aspect in this bill that would rename military bases uh, named after Confederates. Um, uh, Congresswoman Kelly, um, the Trump administration is blocking uh, the Pentagon, including the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, from meeting with Biden's intelligence team reportedly. Are you concerned about how this transition is going right now with respect to defense? I'm very concerned, even though there are some things that are happening, uh, Biden and his team are behind because of, uh, of Trump not even recognizing still uh, that he won. Yes, I am concerned. Uh, I. Um, oftentimes the references made about uh, Bush and 911, how uh, that held up things and, and caused some problems. And we don't want the same thing uh, to happen with uh, President-elect Biden. But no, I'm very concerned about it. All right, uh, Congressman, Congressman Garcia, let's say, move over to another uh, issue in the news. A federal judge recently ruled that um, the acting Homeland Security chief did not have the authority to prevent uh, DACA um, recipients from uh, applying uh, and, and getting status. Uh, what does that mean for the millions of children of undocumented immigrants uh, in the U.S. right now that are concerned about their status? And Congressman, I think you're on mute. We have to unmute you. Today is the 10th anniversary when uh, immigrant youth organized and pushed Congress to pass the DREAM Act. It happened in the uh, Senate. It didn't happen in the House, but this week DHS announced that it will begin accepting new DACA applications the first time since 2017. Thousands of young people have been waiting in limbo for over three years to access this program, living in fear of deportation and what future they may have. The court ruling is an important victory, but yet another reminder of the need for permanent legislative solution. It's a first step and it's needed, but the Biden-Harris administration cannot stop there. They must address the rampant and cruel enforcement rates in our neighborhoods, the reunification of separated children during the Trump White House, and of course, the needed access to social safety nets that undocumented immigrants desperately need, especially in the pand pandemic, and especially uh, with respect to access to the vaccine. And to that effect, uh, Congressman Schneider, uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration has promised action on immigration in its first 100 days. What uh, realistically uh, will an immigration proposal look like in the next Congress and under the next administration? Well, what I hope we can do is something akin to the comprehensive immigration reform that passed the Senate in 2013 with 68 votes. Uh, I helped introduce that bill in the House in 2013 with 180 co-sponsors. Uh, I think we can get broad support for that if it will be allowed to come for a vote. I, I know it will come for a vote in the House. It depends what uh, 
uh, McConnell will do in, in the Senate. But we desperately need immigration reform. As uh, Chewy said, we the, the DACA ruling gives confidence to those hundreds of thousands of young people, some not so young, who have finished school, finished their military, military service, and are now integrated in our workforce, and, and in some cases even leading companies or, or divisions a part of our economy. We need immigration reform for our economy, we need it for our communities, and we need it for the people who live in those communities. All right, Congressman uh, Krishnamurthy, I want to get back to this strained uh, transition process. You know, it looks like only one of your Republican colleagues in Illinois, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, has formally recognized uh, Biden as the president-elect. And uh, you have some of your GOP colleagues openly talking about challenging the electoral college vote on January 6th uh, when it comes to Congress. I'm just curious, your, your reaction to, to all these baseless claims and this process that just continues to be drawn out? It's disgraceful. Um, I, don't, I can't think of another word. Um, you know, regardless of who the president has been in the past, whether it was a Democrat or a Republican, the, um, uh, the predecessor was very graceful in making sure that there was a smooth transition for his successor. And in this case, that's not the, that's not the fact. And what we um, face because of that are increased risks on the national security front, um, as we alluded to before, but also just an erosion of trust in our democratic system. Um, and um, I think that when we uh, tell the rest of the world that they should adopt a democratic form of government, but here um, we have a lot of people who are questioning um, and indeed attacking fellow Republicans who are certifying elections left and right, state after state, I think it does hurt our um, democracy, but it also hurts our image around the world. And Congresswoman Kelly, I mean, you hear all these stories of uh, uh, folks saying, well, off the record or in closed doors, many Republicans acknowledge the victory. Uh, are, do you hear stuff like that from your colleagues? And do they explain to you why this is happening? Honestly, I have not heard that, you know, from my colleagues. I'm extremely disappointed in my Republican colleagues that they're not speaking up. But actually, that's what we've been dealing with for the last four years. Very few have spoken up for what they know is the right thing to do. They've just gone along with uh, the Trump program, and that's what they're doing right now. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, frankly. All right, there's and a lot. Paris, of, yeah, it, go ahead. May, it may help explain uh, why none of our uh, counterparts across the aisle uh, agreed to be on the show tonight. Exactly. Sure, yeah, and yeah. certainly the Washington Post tried to contact many Republicans. Uh, many uh, turned them down. I'm sorry, we have to leave it there. So much to get to, but our thanks tonight to Congressman Robin Kelly, Raja Krishnamurthy, Brad Schneider, and Jesus Chuy Garcia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Paris, thank you. Are you tired of politics as usual? A pair of lawmakers say there is a way to keep officials on their toes, allowing voters to recall them. Amanda Vinicky joins us now to explain. Amanda. Brandis, Illinois actually already does have the ability to recall at least one elected official midterm, that of Illinois governor. Voters in 2010 approved an amendment to the state constitution that gives a pathway to recall a sitting governor. It was at the urging of then governor Pat Quinn, who'd taken over after his predecessor, Rod Blagojevich, was arrested, impeached, and then removed from office. But state Senator Jason Barrickman says that recall provision is basically toothless. It's in name only. No one would be able to use it. It's nearly impossible to use. So we're, cha we're proposing to change that here. And again, equip citizens with the tools they need to hold public officials accountable. The recall process Illinois has now is complicated. It requires a significant number of Illinois electorate to sign on and voters must have what critics have called a permission slip. It has to be signed off on by a bipartisan group of sitting state representatives and senators. Now, Senator Barrickman and Representative Mark Batten of Plainfield, both Republicans say they want to make it easier and they also want to change the constitution to allow for all other statewide elected officials officials to be recalled, as well as all state legislators and local officials. Batnick says he can think of situations at every level of government where there's corruption, but he says what's going on now with Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan is most salient. 
the politicians need to start looking over their shoulder a little bit. And when you have somebody like the speaker who literally is not accountable to very to, to, to the people of the state, the people that he has a lot of control over, I think that's a problem. So this recall process at least gives the, 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 the voters and the citizens of Illinois a tool to change the direction of state government when it's controlled by, by somebody like Speaker Madigan, whether it be now or in the future. We know the broad parameters of the process that they want to move to, but it is still unclear how this would actually work, whether it is legal, but really it's unlikely it's ever going to get to that point. Lawmakers are notoriously reticent to pass any sort of measure that could imperil their own political futures. Plus, Illinois' gubernatorial recall provision was designed to be strict and narrow so that it wouldn't be too easy to throw government into upheaval or to provide enticement for officials to cower to popular public opinion during hard times like now. While there are those who believe that Governor J.B. Pritzker has done a commendable job navigating Illinois through the coronavirus pandemic, Others are furious about the heavy hand that he has taken and the restrictions that he's imposed. A reporter recently asked a question at one of Pritzker's daily coronavirus briefings about whether his job is in jeopardy. You recently talked about Midwest governors and now the governor of Ohio is facing possible impeachment because of orders similar to yours. How close are you to being impeached? <laughs> is that a real question? Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, I uh, look, um, uh, you know, I have a strong approval rating in the state. I think I've done a good job. Um, I know that there are people who run around every day trying to file lawsuits of the snake oil salesman that we've talked about before um, and, uh, you know, trying to gin up uh, opposition to our effort to fight COVID-19. Um, and all I can say is that we're doing the right thing. The courts have affirmed the things that we're doing. Now, Berrickman and Batnick say that their plan is designed so recall would be possible, but it would still be hard to do. So they say it wouldn't be tri triggered by anything trivial. There would have to be real abuse. Now, I did reach out to Speaker Madigan's spokesperson, and he said, having not seen the proposed language, he can't comment on the new recall plan. But in the past, Madigan has been disdainful of a somewhat related effort, and that is former Governor Bruce Rauner's plan to institute to term limits on legislators. Madigan has said that term limits already exist. They're called elections. Back to you, Brandis. Amanda, thank you. Coming up, a guide to navigating Chicago on a bike this winter season. But first, a look at the weather. can get past the idea of turning this into a political topic and really get to serving our communities. That's something I can get behind. Maybe we can use this as a calling card to unite. Still ahead, a guide to winter biking in Chicago, but first we want to take a couple minutes to talk about how important you are to WTTW. Chicago Tonight was created for people like you who want to stay engaged in our community through balanced, inclusive journalism. And tonight we're asking for your help to support this critical source of information by contributing to the new WTTW Fund for Independent News. The fund supports all of our WTTW news initiatives from Chicago Tonight to our digital news service, offering updates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Call 773-588-1111 or go to WTTW.com to support WTTW's new fund for independent news. And tonight when you donate, in addition to receiving a thank you gift, your contribution will be matched dollar for dollar, doubling your impact. Take a look. Make a sustaining gift of $5 a month and we'll thank you with the Chicago Tonight Stainless Tumbler. This is a great way to show your support for trusted news coverage on WTTW. Or make a sustaining contribution of $10 monthly, and we'll thank you with this soft and stylish WTTW hoodie. Or you can receive both the tumbler and hoodie with a gift of $15 a month. All contributions made to the WTTW Fund for Independent News will have double the impact during Chicago Tonight. 
Our generous sponsors, Jim and Kay Maybe, will match every gift at any amount, dollar for dollar, up to $10,000. Call 773-588-1111 or go to WTTW.com to support the Fund for Independent News. What sets Chicago tonight apart is our mission, and that mission is to bring you commercial-free, in-depth, independent news. We are committed to providing a complete and inclusive look at the most important stories in Chicago and the surrounding area. We try to cut through the distractions and focus on the news that you need to know to be informed and make decisions about your life. That's especially important when trying to stay safe during this pandemic. We dig into key issues, analyze them, and find the people who can give best voice to tell those stories. We don't tell you what to think or how to think. We know you want clear and balanced information to develop your own informed opinion. Take tonight's show, for instance. We have Congress folks on. We're asking lots of questions about the pressing issues in Washington or the story we did about Illinois Medicaid reimbursement rates. Lots of views on both sides of that issue, multiple sides of that issue. We want to make sure we present good faith views to you so you can make up your own mind and are aware of these very important issues that affect all of our day-to-day -day lives. And everyone who works on Chicago Tonight is committed to our mission to bring you the best in independent local journalism every day through WTTW News. We hear how much you appreciate the news you can turn that you turn to here on Chicago Tonight as well as online at WTTW.com. And we invite you to contribute right now to support this essential service that you use. Take advantage of the Jim and Kay Maybe Challenge Grant to make your donation go twice as far. Call 773-588-1111 or go to WTTW.com. Thank you so much for your support. And now to Brandis and details on another way to get around town this winter. Brandis. Paris, thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic has driven a huge increase in bicycling for exercise, recreation, and a way to get around without taking transit. So far this year, the weather has been relatively mild, but if you're thinking about biking through Chicago winter for the first time, it might sound like a daunting task. Fortunately, our resident cyclist Nick Blumberg put together an online guide to winter biking in Chicago, which you can find on our website, and he's here now to take us through it. Nick, what can people find in this guide? Well, Brandis, I talked to several cyclists who are even more avid than I am, and they all told me that like a lot of outdoor activities during a Chicago winter, biking is doable with some preparation and the right mindset. Now, the guide that's on our website is broken up into four sections. The first one covers bike gear, so no matter the time of year, having good lights is really important, especially in the winter though, with shorter days and the potential for icy or snowy roads. Another recommendation was fenders for your bike tires. That'll keep the snow and sludge and debris from kicking up at you while you ride. Um, some cyclists also change out their tires for the winter to get some improved traction. Any suggestions on where people can find the best gear? Yeah, well, one of the folks I spoke with was the founder of Bike Lane Uprising. It's a crowdsourced database of bike lane obstructions. They've also put together a winter gear guide. This is stuff cyclists actually use and think is worth your money. And the guide's also got tips if you're on a budget, so you shouldn't have to spend a, a ton of money if you want to ride during the winter. They've also got a holiday gift guide, by the way, in case you haven't figured out what you're buying Good yet. Good to know. Um, I'll pick that right up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you'd rather not invest in winter gear another recommendation is that you can use the Divi bike share system instead so that way you don't have to worry about the maintenance and they're fairly heavy bikes so they might make it easier to handle snowy streets than if you're on a lighter road bike and if you are riding your own bike what can you do to take care of it yeah well winter weather can be really tough on your bike the snow and the salt that just eats away at the components uh, so one simple step is to wipe everything down after you ride I also spoke with a bike mechanic who recommended storing your bike inside if you can, but that's not feasible for everyone. Uh, so you can also just try keeping it covered up like with a tarp or something if you lock it outside. So, so far we've been talking about the bike. What about the rider? Absolutely, that's the third section of the guide, what you need, uh, particularly to stay warm. Everybody knows, I hope, how important it is to layer during the winter. Biking's no exception, but if you ride for any significant length of time, you're likely to warm up and everybody's hot and cold spots are different. Um, all the folks I talked with agreed, you've got to keep your feet and your hands warm. So warm socks, good gloves or mittens. I actually like to layer my gloves. So like a thinner athletic pair under some heavier gloves. 
Um, I also learned about bar mitts. They're basically mittens you put right on the handlebar. <laughs> um, and another cyclist recommended a balaclava to keep your face warm. Okay, so if folks are planning to ride, what you know special techniques should they know about for riding in the winter? Yeah, we cover that in the final section of the guide, what you need to know to bike safely. The biggest piece of advice there is take it slow. It's especially important if you're just starting out. Go slowly, in particular if it's snowy or icy. Be really careful using your brakes. It's just like when you're driving a car. If you start to skid, don't slam on the brakes. That'll make things much worse. And another big theme was to practice, maybe on a day where you don't have somewhere important to be. And take your time. You know, Be comfortable learning as you go. Nobody's born an expert. You don't have to impress anyone or be good at winter biking right away. So take it at whatever pace is comfortable for you. You were born an expert, Nick. <laughs> That's All what right. I tell myself. <laughs> All right. Be safe out there. Thank you so much. Good information. Thanks. Nick Lumberg. And make sure to read our full guide to winter biking in Chicago on our website. With the prospect of a long, dreary winter at home ahead, many Chicagoans have begun adding some life to their abodes with houseplants. WTTW News Director and host of Chicago Tonight Latino Voices, Ugo Balta, dropped by to say hello at some local plant stores to see how business was growing. In the chaos that has characterized 2020, therapist and artist Shalom Parker says her burgeoning collection of houseplants has become more to her than just home decor. For me, a lot of the pandemic has been learning how to care for myself better. Slowing down and taking care of plants every morning has been a part of my routine that has been really, really important to me um, and has helped me to really just to slow down and focus on the plant's growth and my growth at the same time. This is a polia, also known as a money plant. This was really like the start of my buying plants for this season. I went from probably having 10 plants last year into having over 60 plants now. <laughs> According to Nike Vaughn, owner of Plants Alone in Noble Square, Parker is not alone in her desire to bring a little or a lot of nature indoors during the pandemic. One of the things I noticed when we first opened and there was such an influx of new plant parents, um, and there's so many, right, all at once, was we live in a city, we have a lot of apartments with odd lighting situations and people would come in so excited and then they would say, I have one, one window in my room. And you're like, okay. And so you would show them plants that really meet those needs. Though Wong was already a small business owner when the pandemic began, beauty was her business, not begonias. When the shutdown started, she feared her thriving bridal makeup studio would die on the vine. But enough people had shown interest in Vaughn's private plant collection at the shop that she decided the time was ripe for a change. May 2020, it kind of hit home how long uh, the new normal might last and the shutdown and everything, especially for the wedding business and the beauty side. It was such a double whammy. And I think because I already felt comfortable running a small business and I kind of had those resources that pivoting and starting to look at, okay, what does it mean? I've, I'm selling beauty product. What does it mean to sell plant product? We moved very quickly and the community was ready for more plants. And Vaughn says that shared enthusiasm has helped the plant salon flourish in its first year. It's not just buying a plant at a plant shop. It's you have like an entire community of people becoming plant parents together for the first time. Across town in the medical district, Teacher Hilario Dominguez says his interest in houseplants also blossomed during the pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, I really made it a goal to, to figure out how I can get grounded for the summer, you know, and that kind of led me to trying to figure out how I can garden at my own home. It's such a healing process. Taking care of plants uh, really requires just so much of you, so much patience um, and, and so much openness. Dominguez says when he began creating his home Eden, he found support for his new hobby in online plant communities. The plant community in Chicago in general is just so beautiful. Um, it's such a connected, uh, such a helpful community. He discovered Plant Shop Chicago in the north side Mayfair neighborhood through those communities. <laughs> Co-owners Ozzy Gamez and Juan Quesada say the pandemic unexpectedly created fertile ground for their business to thrive online. At the beginning, you know, everything's closing down. We have to close down and the idea of just moving all of that online and doing it virtually came about. And I think 
at the time we were one of the few people to be doing that to offer online or uh, plants online locally and deliver them as well and offer curbside pickup very much like uh, like a re restaurant would do you know kind of just took off from there there was a tight community in this it wasn't just like you know, there was more than people just going to Home Depot or any like big box store and just like buying a plant. There was like a community where like people were into certain plants. And as the uptick in sales gives Gamez and Quesada some peace of mind about the health of their business, they say their customers are reporting an uptick in their mental health too. A lot of the times we just seen these little notes for, you know, that they wrote just telling us thank you for being here and, you know, providing the service. Because now I have something to do at home and it just kind of keeps my mind of like everything that's going on and just something as small as that, I feel like it's a huge, you know, huge change and for, for anyone, a lot of help. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Hugo Valta. And we'll have more on the houseplant craze in the coming weeks on our weekend shows, Chicago Tonight Latino Voices and Black Voices. So be sure to look out for that Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe. And good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.